there's no bargains. When one guy drops out, then a guy like Harden, who just had 54, is going to have the ball more. Where's the bargain there? You are locked on Fantasy Basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Today we're going to be talking about the 10 games we had in the NBA on Wednesday, a trade between the Utah Jazz and the Cleveland Cavaliers and then preview a three-game slate for Thursday across the NBA. So Michael Bolton, Let's get to it. to it. All right, that is a very, very good idea, of course. We're now going to give you the... Monstrous line of the night. Once again, it's Jim Harden of the Houston Rockets. Harden was, uh, as the name would imply, a monster once more. 25, 11, and 17 with four threes and six steals. The Rockets uh, went down by 20 points. They got smashed by the Mavericks, but Harden was fantastic. 7 of 9 from the line, 7 of 15 from the field. He's your number one fantasy player for this season, averaging more points than last season. The numbers are fantastic. His last seven games, 37 points. Five and a half rebounds, 10 assists, and 2.7 steals. Just an absolute fantasy monster continuously. He's ranks the last five seasons, including this one. Two, three, one, two, one. That is remarkable consistency for this bloke. Taking him in the top two of drafts is an absolute no-brainer, and it will be until further notice. He just accumulates numbers at a... Uh, at a quite ludicrous rate, and he is uh, doing it again. But the Rockets continue to struggle, and you feel that there's some moves coming for the Rockets. There pretty much has to be, given how much they are currently struggling uh, with another big loss today to the Mavericks. Waiver wire line of the night. The waiver wire line of the night is also your young gun of the night, and it is for the second time in in two days as well, much like Jim Harden. Ryan Archer-Jackano of the Chicago Bulls, didn't qualify for the deep leaguer of the night because he's rostered in 6% of Yahoo leagues, but 38 minutes in the Bulls' narrow loss to the Bucks, 22 points with 5 triples, 5 rebounds, 4 assists, and he had 5 steals as well. Archer Jackano is a top 60 player over the last 4 games in 37 minutes, to, to be fair. Not a high priority add. In Within 2 weeks, his value is going to disappear because that's when Chrissy Dunn is going to return, but for the short term... In a streaming spot, someone like Archer Jackano can be useful, but it, it is worth worth mentioning and worth looking at. The last two games, 44 points combined. Lots of minutes, seven steals combined, six assists. That's fine. The game prior to that against the Minnesota Timberwolves, he played 34 minutes and had zero points. The game prior to that, he played 40 minutes and had five points. So this recent scoring explosion is really out of nowhere for Archer Jackano. Those two prior games, he had a usage of under 10%, up to 17 in the last two games, and the shots have been falling. So he is really you know, hit or miss, really. In his uh, in his starting run here, which has lasted 10 games, he's had four five double-digit score, four double-digit scoring games, sorry, and um, yeah, a few decent assist games and a couple of multi-steel games, three multi-steel games, but it hasn't been a fantastic run. Just these last two games have really skewed it, and they look pretty bloody sexy, but the other games before that obviously weren't that exciting for Archer Jackano, and his value is very, very very short-term. There are other guys who performed at the point guard position on uh, on today's slate who I'd much rather add over Arch, but this is a uh, you know, really two nice back-to-back -back performances. Again, you can add him in a 12, more 14 or 16, but then he goes back to playing 16, 17 minutes a night. Once done, is fully healthy and that value disappears. But there is something there for him at the moment, uh, at the very least. I need to tell you about the uh, the great guys who are sponsoring today's podcast today, and that is the fine folks over at Action Heat. Action Heat, they make the world's best battery-heated clothing. For all of you guys in the United States who are heading into the cold part of the season, it just doesn't get as cold here as what you guys get over there. Literally never seen snow once where I live, and it gets cold-ish, but what's it get down to? Four or five degrees Celsius, where you guys are, are very much below zero. Action Heat clothing, it's going to be the perfect thing for you or a gift for a family member 
member, partner, friend who has to suffer through the coldness of winter. Action Heat Clothing is engineered to safely and efficiently deliver heat via heating panels similar to a heated car seat. I've got those in my car. I pretty, enjoy that. I pretty much enjoy those. It can reach temperatures of up to 135 degrees and are powered by rechargeable 5-volt lithium-ion batteries that last up to 12 hours on every charge. So you charge them. You can also charge them while you're wearing them with your phone or any other uh, sort of device that has uh, has power. Anyone who likes the outdoors, lives in the cold climate, wants to go to the snow, Action Heat is the perfect gift. Heated jackets, socks, gloves, hats, and even undergarments like the heated base layer shirts and long johns, helping you stay warm and cozy all through the frigid winter months. If you... We've got a special deal if you are interested in Action Heat clothing, and you should be checking it out anyway. You can save 20% off your entire order by going to actionheat.com slash locked on to check out everything Action Heat has to offer. That's actionheat.com slash locked on, or you can just use the coupon code locked on at checkout to save 20%. Stay toasty warm while you enjoy all of your outdoor activities this winter with Action Heat, and we thank them, of course, for sponsoring this podcast. Let's move on to the deep leaguer of the night, and it is Timmy Frazier of the New Orleans Pelicans, a name who uh, was getting bandied about quite a bit on the old fantasy Twitter today because he last minute moved into the starting lineup and lots of weird stuff with the Pelicans and Anthony Davis really talking up the fact that Drew Holiday isn't a point guard and he hates playing point guard. So it makes me think that uh, Timmy Frazier is going to stick in the starting lineup. He played 37 minutes. Had 12 points, 6 rebounds, 12 assists, and 2 steals. Alvin Gentry was really Dutch ruddering him after the game as well. We wanted him to push the pace, and that's exactly what he did. Blah, blah, blah. And that's great, because this is a really strong performance from Frazier. But we have to remember, he also started two games earlier on when Alfred Payton was injured and had 8-1-1 one, and 8-2-5 one, and eight, two, and five in those starts and was generally putrid in those performances. So while this is great, and it's not like uh, he just needs this opportunity to start because he has had the opportunity to start, and he's literally been out of the rotation for six of the last seven games and really only you know, found himself in a, such a large role today because Frank Jackson was a late scratch as well. But you'd have to imagine that he take, he's taken that opportunity and he will remain starting until Lord Alfred returns. That makes him, I think, a pretty strong... 12 team, a pretty strong 14 team league ad uh, with some 12 team value there. But this is, you know, I know Matt Smith's a massive Tim Frazier fan. I'm not quite a big, as big of, of a Frazier uh, fan as what, as what Matty is, but Timmy can provide the assists. No doubt about that. He can generate steals uh, also, not, not the greatest uh, steals guy, but um, yeah, has put up some decent, de- decent numbers that the Wizards, and this was a really high pace, high totaled game. So that did elevate quite a bit. The Wizards defensively aren't all that great as well, especially against point guards. So that did help him. So I'd look at this as almost a high watermark for Frazier and not be expecting, not be expecting this all that often from him, but worth a look again, not my, I'd probably prioritize him a little bit over Archer Jackano, but behind someone who may be playing for the Phoenix Suns, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But again, remember, this is a great performance. He also sucked when he played those when he started those first two games during Peyton's first injury, eight, two and five, and eight, one and one. Hardly the stuff of legend in those performances, but a strong game from Timmy in today's uh, today's game. I've already said the, the young gun of the night was Arch as well. So let's move on to the dud of the night. I tell a man's not hot. It's another point guard. It's ravishing Rick Rubio, who absolutely sucked. 32 minutes for Rick, six points on zero of nine shooting. That is almost as bad as it gets. Three rebounds and four assists. He did hit all six of his free throws, so I guess you could count that as a positive for Rubio, but it was not great. He is still a top 100 player this season. Um, so for all the hand wringing about how much he sucked, and his shooting is at career-worst levels at 37% from the field. That's really, really bad, including 32% from three. I think there's significant room for him to improve from here. Um, but it's not great. He's still a must-hold guy. He's not losing the starting position or anything along those lines. He's never getting back to 34 minutes a night, I don't think. He's never getting back to nine assists per game. We've talked about that plenty of times. But in that 70 to uh, 60 to 90 type zone in terms of rest of season rankings, I think that's where you should be looking at ravishing Rick. And uh, I would imagine that shooting, while I'm, you know, I'm not a super confident person in Rubio becoming a great shooter, I think he'll be better than what he has been shooting, a dismal 40.6% from two-point range so far this season, which of course is uh, pretty disgusting. The plus-minus goats of the day, 
Um, Roycey O'Neill of the Jazz was a plus 117.4, while the worst net rating went to Jared Dudley, a negative 102.6. That's, I think, the second time in about the last week that Duds has picked up the uh, goat of the night for, on the negative side of things. Still in the rotation, but as that backup now to Rondé Hollis-Jefferson and not providing any fantasy stats at all. Well, O'Neill had a really strong game, but I don't think we need to look too much into it because there are some things which we're going to talk about in a second that are changing with the Utah Jazz and their rotation. Let's. Uh, we'll get to that in a sec. Just a quick uh, yeah, injury update here. The Bulls guys, uh, Punch Bob Shiploke, Bobby Portis, and Chris Dunn recovering from their MCL injuries. They're probably about two weeks away from returning. So, and I think we're going to have Larry Markin and coming back at a similar time. Those two guys, Dunn and Portis, are going to be limited when they return. I would imagine coming back from a lower body injury versus an upper body injury. It takes a little bit of time, but I would prioritize uh, out of those guys, Dunn, Markin, and Portis, if they're on your waiver wire. Uh, well, Dunn and Markin, it really depends on what sort of player you need. If you need you know, big man eligible or, or small guy eligible, depending on what guy you need, but they are considerably above where Portis is, in my opinion, in terms of prioritizing. These are two guys who should be top 70 guys for the rest of the season, whereas Portis, I'm not sure, will even be a top 100 guy for the rest of, rest of the year. In fact, I, I feel pretty confident in saying that Portis won't be a top 100 guy, whereas uh, those other guys, uh, I feel pretty confident in saying that they that they will be. So they're the priority there. If they are on your wire, you should be looking to grab them. Of course, if you are right down the bottom of the standings and you're yeah, struggling, holding zeros for two weeks may not be the best way of going about it because you might get another couple of losses and not be able to catch up when they come back. But this is a perfect time if they are on waivers that you'd go and uh, and take a squiz at both Chris Dunn and Bob Portis. Let's talk the trade that did go down. Now, Kyle Korver traded from the Cleveland Cavaliers to the Utah Jazz in exchange for Alec Burks and two future uh, second round draft choices. So in terms of what we're looking at here, it's basically... Uh, Corver for Burks. Now, whenever a trade goes down, it doesn't matter what the trade is. There is always going to be people, you know, add for 12. Do we go and add this guy in 12, 10 leagues? It's always going to be that. The case here is no. No, it's not. Corver moves over and he takes Alec Burks' role. He's not taking Donovan Mitchell's minutes at the two. He's not taking Jingle and Joe's minutes at the three. He is 37 years of age and he provides a great bench three-point shooting option. He is not coming in and playing 34 minutes a night. And even when he did back in his prime, he wasn't a guy that was um, yeah, that was you know, carrying fantasy. I think he had one strong fantasy season in Atlanta, one or two strong fantasy seasons, but he wasn't this must-roster player. Very, very little changes here from Corver from what he was doing in Utah or in Cleveland versus now in Utah. Maybe he's a top 200 guy. Yeah, at best, maybe he becomes a top 170 sort of player. As for Burks... Well, it's very much the same again. He he moves in and he takes Kyle Korver's minutes. Is he going to take uh, Padawan Colin Sexton's minutes? No. Is he going to take Rocket Rodney Hood's minutes? Probably not. George Hill is still to come back. Jordan Clarkson is still there. So Burks isn't going to come in and start playing multiple, you know, huge 29 minutes a night or anything along those lines. Maybe George Hill gets dealt at some point. Most likely he gets dealt. But that still doesn't mean that Burks is going to be moving in and playing an absolute ton of minutes. And even in his best season in terms of minutes, back in the 14-15 season where he played 33 minutes a night, he was the 143rd ranked player, Alex Bur Alec Burks, averaging 14-4-3 and three with you know, low steal numbers. He's a low assist, low steal sort of a player, low rebounds, not great efficiency. He is not really someone that you should be looking at uh, for... 14 team leagues, 12 team leagues, not for those ones, nothing shallower. 16 maybe, but even then could be a stretch. 18 team leagues maybe, this really doesn't move the needle for fantasy. So don't think that this is some great move to get. This is basically the Cavs doing a doing a solid for Kyle Korver and acquiring two seconds and the Jazz strengthening up their bench, getting that shooter that they need. Uh, to help them out, it, it doesn't move the needle for you know ninety percent of you listening to this from a fantasy point of view. This does absolutely nothing to have any impact. They are not ten or twelve or even fourteen team league guys. They are left for the deeper formats, and that is it. Pau Gasol is dealing with a foot stress fracture that is going to cost him months. I would guess there's no timetable at this point, but if he is not out for ten to twelve weeks, I would be pretty shocked. Um, you, you, you have to start sympathizing, I guess, with Kawhi Leonard and the Spurs medical staff. How long has Powell been out with a sore foot? And now he had to go get a second opinion. And, oh, actually, it's actually broken. 
Um, that's that's troublesome. We've seen this with many, many teams and their terrible medical staff. The Philadelphia 76ers, the San Antonio Spurs, another one coming up. The Chicago Bulls has one of the worst medical staffs in the NBA. And I know there's a team that I'm forgetting, but that's you know, disheartening for a guy that was dealing with a sore foot and has been miss, missing the last couple of weeks and now he's going to miss months. And this is it the end of Powell's career? There's a real possibility. You're having a stress fracture in your feet at the age of 40 or 38 or whatever he is, it's uh, it's not great for Gasol. It does help to solidify Jakob Pertl's value. He's still just going to be that 16-team league guy, not change. Again, if you didn't add Pertl or Bertans over the last two weeks or find that they were guys you considered, then you don't consider them now. Nothing actually changes in that regard. Malik Monk had to leave today's game with a quad contusion. Originally, they said he was available to return, and they updated to say he wasn't. He was getting back into a groove, but it doesn't really change anything if he happens to miss uh, miss much much time. It opens up minutes for the Baconator, Dwayne Bacon, there in uh, in Charlotte as well. If he does miss time, but nothing nothing massive or, or nothing major that we're really uh, seeing happen there with that Monk injury, which again doesn't appear to be too serious. Let's move on now. There were 10 games for us to talk about across the NBA on uh, on Wednesday, so we'll get into those ones right now. The first one of those games was, and I talked about this yesterday in the DFS preview, that it was going to be a day of blowouts, and it was a day of blowouts. Half the games you know, finished with significantly uh, significantly large margins, uh, you know, huge, pretty huge blowouts in in at least uh, at least five, and you could you could say maybe maybe six if you want to count the Phoenix Clippers game. But yeah, some real blowouts, and this one was one of them. David Fisdale and his New York Knicks rotation. The Knicks lost 91 to 117. There is no way of knowing what to do. We talked about Alonzo Trier yesterday, and then he came in and played 22 minutes and had eight and three. Now I'm pretty thankful that I mentioned that his shooting was pretty unsustainable because he went out and had uh, and shot three of 11 and didn't have any defensive numbers, which were really propping up his stats. These, you just cannot rely upon what Fisdale is going to do with him or Damo Dotson, who had 16 points in 24 minutes. The fact that the Knicks got their asses kicked means they're just as likely to change their starting lineup for next game because Fisdale is as reactionary a coach as there is and not proactive. And I think that's a terrible quality in a coach. Um, and you can, people, I, I seem to have a differing opinion on Fisdale than pretty much anybody. Uh, I just don't think he's a good coach, and there's no consistency with these guys at all. Noah Vonley in foul trouble again, 18 minutes, 4 and 7. I don't think he's that good. He is not a must-hold 12-team league player. Well, Mitchell Robinson had his foul trouble. Blocked four shots. He's a, sp a blocks specialist. That is it. 17 minutes. He will eventually get more minutes, I would hope, but, but who knows. In this one, it was Mario Hazonia who got the minutes. 26 minutes. 17 and 5 with four steals. That's very reminiscent of what he was doing during his time in Orlando last season. But again, no way of trusting. He'd been under 20 minutes for all his other starts, hadn't done anything near to this, while the Fort Kevin Knox finally got some playing time and had 9 and 7. There are there is people who are still holding on to him in standard leagues, and I have absolutely no idea why. Do not have Kevin Knox on your 10 or 12 or 14 team league roster. He would need 82 minutes a game to crack the top 100. And yeah, I'm not Big Shaq. Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three, quick maths. But I'm pretty sure that's going to be impossible for him to achieve. Trey Burke, the peaks and valleys with this guy are insane. 16 minutes for seven points. Manuel Moutier, shit again, what a surprise. Three points in 21 minutes, while everybody, Frank Neil just needs to get traded. They hate him in New York, zero points in 14 minutes. As I said the other day, some of it's on him, but uh, just a, a disaster in terms of the way they're developing this team. And again, I am just completely on the other side to everybody else on, on Fizdar. And we'll see who's right in the end. On to the Sixers. Again, we didn't need to see big minutes from these guys. I did talk about how TJ McConnell puts up big lines against the Knicks. He did it again. 25 points. No, he didn't. 25 minutes. Six points, two rebounds, six assists, two steals, and a block. Do not overrate this. Jim Butler, 25 minutes. Uh, ben Simmons, 24 minutes. It was just a blowout. This was, it was like 25 points at halftime pretty much in this game. So that's why the minutes are are all sort of skewed. Embiid is still a monster. 26, 14, and 7 with a steal and a block as he uh, he helped pants the uh, New York Knickerbockers. Let's go on to the next game now. This one, thankfully, wasn't that much of a blowout. Still a 14-point margin as the Atlanta Hawks got beaten by the Charlotte Hornets, 108-94. Trey Young was solid, just poor shooting again, 18-4 with four assists and two steals, while the artist formerly known as Torian Prince picked up five fouls, including two fouls in about the first four minutes. 
12 points, three rebounds, one assist, one steal, and one block. This is an excellent buy low. People hate Torian Prince in fantasy. They're always quick to jump off him. He still put up 12 and four in uh, in 20 minutes, had foul trouble, and he's still a top 90 player for the season despite some of his struggles. I think he is going to bounce back from this. It's been a really poor shooting display. The minutes have been reduced due to significant foul trouble in a lot of his games as well. Um, his last four games, he's had four fouls, two fouls, four fouls, and five fouls. So limiting his playing time there, some poor shooting nights, and look, some just a, look, some shit performances, no doubt about that. But I think we look, he scored 18, 16, 18, and 12 in the last three games. He had a string of 20, three 20 point performances at the start of November 23, 22, and 21. Uh, I'm, I'm adding him. If he gets dropped anywhere, I'm adding him. I'm throwing my worst player at whoever has him on their team and trying to acquire him. Kevin Huerta started, played 34 minutes and had 12, 5, and 4 with 4 triples. That's getting tasty. I'm excited in that. I'm interested. I'm watching him in 12-team leagues. I'm adding him in 14-team leagues. But this is sort of what we talked about for this team so much in the offseason about they're going to want to see big minutes between Young and Huerta. It's happened earlier, but it's happened. The Baptist had 9, 10, and 4, while Kent Bazemore, 8, 5, and 3 with 3 blocks. He tried to Ricky Rubio this game 0 of 10 from the field, an absolute disaster in terms of shooting. The defensive stats are nice. But uh, the bench roll, I think in 10-team leagues, you can feel comfortable dropping him. In 12s, it would depend on who I'm adding. But if I'm going to end, add an ascending player like a certain French point guard in Phoenix, I reckon I'd be happy, happy to do that sort of move. There was no Jeremy Lin in this game as well. So that probably did help Huerta's minutes. But uh, Bembry and Bazemore weren't able to take advantage of that. On the Hornets, Jeremy Lamb apparently pushing for an all-star bid. 22 points with five rebounds, 32 minutes. He is rock solid, locked in. Uh, James Borrego loves him now after some uh, iffy moments at the start of the season. A top 50 guy over the last two weeks. You love what he is doing. Kid Gilchrist played two minutes in the first half, which was interesting. Ended with 16 minutes, had two steals, but uh, that, that playing time was odd. While Frank Kaminsky has taken over the backup center role from Bill Hernan Gomez, of course, the bill can be dropped in all formats. While Marvin Williams, I said that those last two games were flukes. Hope you believe me because he had zero points in 22 minutes. So with everyone back, he is not going to be a 12 or even a 14 team league player. Kemba uh, struggled a little bit. He had 19, 4, and 3. Still had the four steals, and it's not a horrendous line, but it's uh, obviously not exactly where you would want it to be. Well, Nick Batum, my mate, 13, 6, and 3 with two steals and a block. That is a Nick Batum special minus the assists. I'm, I'm happy to add him in 12-team leagues if he was dropped. I still will continue to believe in Batum uh, ongoing. But in 10-team leagues, I'm not quite sure that he's there as a must-roster player because of the way that the offense is running and his assists are being lowered. He is, again, still a top 100 player over the course of the season. For as much shit as he gets, he is still up there in that top 100. The next game we have a look at is the Utah Jazz getting the victory over the Brooklyn Nets, 101-91. The Don, Donovan Mitchell returned, 29 points with four steals. This is very much like 17-18 Don Mitchell, so that's great. Same with Ravishing Rip Rick. Not Ravishing Rick. Try again. Ravishing Rudy? Nah. 23-16 and 16 for Gobert with four blocks. Big men against the Nets. Big men against the Knicks. Uh, they're, they're very, very interesting. Now, Gobert's free throws were trash. Three of nine. He has been atrocious in that area. In general, if someone shows you they're a bad free throw shooter, you just believe that they are. 58% from the line on six attempts. One of the worst free throw negative impact guys over the course of this season. Jingle and Joe didn't do too much, but still filled it out with seven rebounds, five assists, and two steals. Favors was okay. He's a back-end 12er, while Crowder is uh, he's not that good. Um, three points in 24 minutes. For the Nets, Dinwiddie had 18, a strong night there. D'Angelo had 14, 5, and 7 with three steals. A shit shooting night from Russell. 6 of 25 is disastrous, but overall, the counting stats are nice. While Rondé Hollis Jefferson played 28 minutes. He had 14 and 11. He's fine to add in a 12-team league guy. He's pretty low upside. He's not a 10-teamer. While Jarrett Allen just struggled along to uh, 14 and 10. Eddie Davis, I talk about block streamers like Mitch Robinson. Um, I talk about a steel streamer like Big Shaq Harrison. Big Shaq. Talk about uh, threes streamers like the Duke Wayne Ellington. Assist streamers like JJ Barea. Your best rebound streamer is Ed Davis. He just pulls in boards at an uncanny rate. 10 here in 17 minutes for uh, for Big Ed. Let's go on to the next game. It's the Dallas Mavericks smacking the Houston Rockets 128-108. What is going on with Devin Harris? That is his second big game in the last week. 20 points with five triples, four assists, and two blocks. Honestly, amazing that he is actually still in the league. Over the last week, a top 50 fantasy player because he's had an 18-3 and three game with four steals, and then 20 points, five triples, and two blocks today. Do not get overly excited with this from Devin. 
Dennis Smith, great from Smitty. 10, 5, and 5, four steals and a block, and four of eight from the field. The 31 minutes are super encouraging as well. If he was dropped, I would add him while Juan Jose, yeah, Juan Jose Barrea had uh, 13 points, 18 minutes, 12 assists. The best assist streamer that is on your wire. Not going to be for everybody, so that's why he's not a must roster player, but he's probably someone who should be on a 12 team roster. John Ray Jordan had 13 and 7. Wasn't his best night. Uh, only the 24 minutes against the Rockets, while Wesley Matthews and the pencil Harrison Barnes struggled. 11 points for Matthews, 13 for Barnes in 29. But I, got, I quickly got to talk about Luka Doncic. He played 24 minutes. He had 20 points, six rebounds, two assists, and a steal. He is he's so good. He is, uh, yeah, he's he's gonna be so good. And people people might I've heard people say, oh maybe, but he's what else is he gonna do? Is he he's reached his ceiling? And maybe he has. But he's still he's still unbelievable. Like he's unbelievable as a rookie, averaging nineteen six and four. He can get better than this, in my opinion. He will start to produce more defensively, more steals, more blocks. He's uh, I think he'll be able to average twenty two or twenty three points a game in the NBA pretty quickly. He's already at nineteen. He is going to be an absolute stud. Onto the Rockets, another big Capella night, eighteen and eight with two blocks. While um, Jimmy Ennis got hot as well, eighteen points on thirteen attempts at sixty two percent shooting. Two triples, really just a hit and hope sort of guy that you add in and go, oh, maybe he's going to give me something. He generally won't, so I wouldn't get too excited there. Well, Daniel House, who, yes, is on an NBA team. Uh, he was on the... Uh, Daniel House played for the Wizards last season and the Suns and then started this season on the Warriors, and now he's on the Rockets and had 18 points in 23 minutes. When Gerald Green and Chris Paul return, he likely won't be in the rotation. Nene also likely to return over the weekend, which will probably put an end to Isaiah Hartenstein and whatever the game it is that Marquise Chris thinks that he's playing out on the basketball court. The, the Comet Gary Clark is just a defensive stats streamer. Two steals and one block, and uh, pretty much nothing else. Just a weird-ass night in the NBA. Another blowout. The Cavs, 83. The Thunder, 100. The Padawan, Colin Sexton, 21 and 10. Really strong performance. The 10 rebounds are a surprise. One steal is nice. Three assists are low. But as I've said with him plenty of times, he is the point guard, Andrew Wiggins. Chetty Osman, 14, 10, and 6, 40 minutes. The minutes are consistent. They are always going to be there. You're going to have to deal with some shit nights, but I do think he's a 12-teamer. Well, Geordie Clarkson played 34 minutes. That will go down when Burks arrives. 25 with four triples here. He did take on majority of Kyle Korver's minutes. Larry Nance started, played 36, had 7 and 10 with two assists. You grab him, you roster him. And then we see what nonsense Larry Drew does when uh, when Nwaba and Decker return, whether he just pushes Nance back to be that backup to Tristan Thompson. Speaking of Thompson, this is the Tristan Thompson that we know and love. 4-2-2 two, and two in 35 minutes. He'd been playing at a level that was really quite nonsense, to be honest. But still, despite how well he's played, he still is only the 114th ranked player this season. To be fair to him, top 90 over the last month, averaging 12-12. and 12. But he is a uh, he's a rebounds guy, and he's a field goal percentage guy. His steal numbers have been really elevated as well. He's never been a high steals guy. Even back in the 16-17 season where he played 30 minutes, he had half a steal a game. This season, over the last month, he's getting 1.3. That is due to decline. So he, he's fine for now. Just don't expect it to last. On to the Thunder. Westbrook had a triple-double, 23-19 and 15. Well, Jeremy Grant went off 21-5 and five with four blocks. He's a, pretty much a 12-team league guy. Limited upside, although today's performance would probably belie that. This is just not going to happen that often. Steve-O Adams, 6-5 and five with two blocks. This uh, a bit of a shit one from Schroeder. Six points in 23 minutes. This is the concern that when everyone gets healthy, that we'll see more of these and some of those big performances. Abrines started, played 27. We're still waiting for MC Hamadou Diallo, Terry Ferguson, and uh, Andre Robertson to return. Those guys should start filtering in at least Ferguson and Diallo over the next couple of weeks. And that's going to impact Schroeder. You still hold him for now. In 10-team leagues, in 18 leagues, he's gone. In 10-team leagues, I think he's pretty borderline with the arrow pretty clearly pointing down for uh, for Den Schroeder. Uh, Timotei Lawawu Cabrera went from starting to playing only four minutes. Sucks to be him. Let's go on to the next game. Another blowout. The Wizards lost to the Pelicans, 125-104. Big minutes again from Beal. 16-5 and 11 with two steals in 35 minutes. Well, Kelly Oubre finally put up a good game. 22-6, and six, four triples, two steals and a block. To me, he's still more of a 14-teamer. He is a flyer 12-team league guy. Just look at the previous games where he'd struggled to stay out of foul trouble or to do anything positive really at all. But is this one of these games where Otto Porter's back in the doghouse? Because that's what happened. 25 minutes for Porter while uh, Ubre got 35. 5-5 five and five for Porter. 
Uh, it's going to be something to monitor. It didn't impact Markeith Morris, who had 22 and 9 in his 32 minutes, although a lot of the value that Morris is providing is because Dwight is out. But I think Markeith is, I'd have Markeith added over Ubre in 12 team formats. Uh, Thomas Bryant. Two rebounds in 14 minutes. He's, I think he'll remain as uh, in the rotation. Actually, you know what? I don't think he will remain in the rotation when Dwight returns because they're not playing any backup centers now and he hasn't really done enough to, to yeah, make sure he's in there. It'll be more Mark Keefe and, uh, and more Jeff Green. My name is Jeff. On to the Pelicans. Davis had 28 and 15 with two blocks. Holiday had 29, 7 and 5 with that insane efficiency. Randall 23 and 12 on 67% shooting. And Miritich had 15 and 9 with two steals and a block. So big performances from the big guns. Etwan Moore, who had that nice little hot streak. Just always remember that with Etwan Moore, that he will have those nights and he has this run where he shoots 58%. And then when it gets back to being a normal person, then he's absolutely terrible for fantasy. Well, actually, that's not true. He's nowhere near a 10 or 12 team must roster guy. Over the last four games, he's outside the top 150, shooting 41% from the field. Um, you know, you expect that to go back up, but he's more of a guy who's the 130th best player rather than the guy who was the 50th best player there for a stretch where he was shooting at you know, insane levels with high efficiency numbers. Not much else uh, to talk about with the Pelicans unless you're a massive Solomon Hill fan who is back in the rotation nowadays. On to the next game, another blowout. The San Antonio Spurs got punked by the Timberwolves, 128 to 89. And just a quick thing on the Timberwolves, get ready. If you're a Tom Thibodeau supporter, you won't want to turn off. But since Jimmy Butler's been traded, the Timberwolves are the number one team in defense. And you might say, well, Josh, you've got to give Thibodeau credit there. Yep, okay, they are. But, but, the fact that Thibodeau has an absolute, hmm, what's the right word? Rudimentary understanding of how a person exists in the world, that he thought that they could have someone like Jimmy Butler demand to be traded, tell his teammates that he was pissed, come in and swear at everybody, berate them on a consistent basis, you know, curse out the front office that he could do that, and Thibodeau could sit out there with his hand on his dick, yeah, look at this, it's fantastic, thinking that. And thinking that that was going to translate into a great and winning team. And we're not trading Butler because I need to win games. All you needed to do was trade him. And now you're winning games because having a good environment, having chemistry is so important to you know, success in, in team sports. And this, this bloke just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it at all and think, I've got to have Jimmy to win these games. Maybe he just needed a, a better environment uh, to do it. Now, I'm not saying this is going to stick as the number one defense, but for, for, seriously, like this bloke just doesn't understand humans. He, he's, he's, has he ever interacted with a human? Can you ever imagine Tom Thibodeau sitting on the couch with his hand down his pants, watching TV in a pair of track pants? Yeah, I, 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 I feel like he is like... What's the guy's name? Barney on How I Met Your Mother, and he goes to sleep in, in suit pajamas. That's how it feels like with Thibodeau. Anyway, on to the Spurs. They made a change. Derek White back starting. It wasn't the greatest night from White, but 6-2-4 and four in 23 minutes. I did have a feeling that something was going to happen here. I don't know whether he sticks as the starting point guard. And we're not adding him in 10 or 12 team leagues, but I'm watching him. I'm watching him in 14-16, to 16, and I've been really mentioning that I think he's going to have a 12-team stretch of value at some point this season, and maybe it's here, here it begins. But it's hard to get a full judge on anything here with the Spurs because it was a blowout. Bryn Forbes is not a 12-team league guy. Rudy Gay, under 20 minutes for two consecutive games. I'm still holding him, and if anyone drops him, I'd, I'd add him. But it's just been a disaster for the Spurs. On to the Wolves. Townsie had 16, 11, and 5 with two steals, and this game was such a blowout that he played only 28 minutes. Jeff Teague played only 24 minutes, and perhaps the biggest barometer of how much of an ass-kicking this was, Bob Covington played only 31 minutes, had 21 and 9 with four triples of steel and a block, and is unbelievable, while Andrew Wiggins continues to be terrible. 10 points in uh, 30 minutes on 15 shots. Uh, literally, there was an argument on Twitter. It was uh, yeah, analytics versus eye test about who would you want, Andrew Wiggins or Bob Covington. Um, I don't think that argument's still going. Uh, I hope it is, because it'd be pretty funny to go check it out. But yeah, uh, I think we know who's the better player. For fantasy, it's not it's not even remotely close. Uh, anyway, of course, uh, Covington is a must-roster player. Derek Rose, only uh, 18 minutes, but had 16 points and hit another four triples as his insane shooting season continues. But uh, Dario Saric, not a 12er. Taj Gibson, not a 12er. They're going to keep uh, cannibalizing each other's value and playing time, it appears. 
Let's go on to the next game. It was a close one. One of the games that should have been a blowout. The Chicago Bulls losing to the Milwaukee Bucks, 113-116. Zachy Levine, 24-9-7. Just big, big numbers from Levine consistently and didn't shoot too badly in this one, so that's a positive. While my man Wendell Carter Jr. got into foul trouble again. Fouled out in 24 minutes, had 6-7-3. This is a real buy low. Again, like I said with a player earlier on, I can't remember which player it was. Throw your worst player at whoever has Carter. Check your waiver away. If he has dropped, I am adding him. This is a, a long game the majority of the time, unless you're in real shit, shit area um, and you can't, you're on the bottom of your standings, you need to get up. You can wait. He's going to get better. He's not going to lose a starting job, I don't think, anyway. If he loses it to Bob Portis and Fred Hoiberg should be taken out in handcuffs. It's a real buy low opportunity here for Carter. Justin Holiday shot badly. He's been shooting really well. Uh, eight points on 10 shots. Still had two threes. Still had uh, two steals. Still had four assists. A must roster guy, but I do feel that a fair chunk of his value is going to disappear. Same with Jabari Parker, who had 24, 8, and 5 in 33 minutes. Continue to ride Jabari until the wheels fall off. On to the Bucks. Brogo, 24, 5, and 6, while Yanni had 36, 11, and 8 with two steals. And um, you're punting free throws with Antetokounmpo. It's pretty straightforward. Bledsoe, 7, 6, and 4, and Middleton, 17, 6, and 4, including the game winner. While Brook Lopez got the better, actually, no, he didn't get the better of his brother because he had 12 points, and Robin had 17 in a weird 23 minute performance from Bob Lopez. Uh, Paddy Connaughton, deeper league sort of guy, two blocks, seven points in 24 minutes. He's taken some of those big ragu minutes, Dante DiVincenzo. Uh, as he works his way back from a knee injury, he's eliminated Tone Snell pretty much out of the rotation, while Thon McCare had zero points with three rebounds in 11 minutes. And it looks like the Muppet John Henson's going to miss pretty much all the regular season, but McCare is just a 16 to 18 team league sort of a player. The next game that we take a look at is the Orlando Magic going down to the Portland Trailblazers, 115-112. Vooch just continues on, unabated, 28-7 and with two blocks and two triples, while Fournier had a bounce back. I did touch on that one. 17-3-4 with two blocks, while my man Johnny Isaac, I think he's a 12-team league guy, I've consistently said it, 30 minutes, 16 points, seven rebounds, two triples and a blocks, but caveat is here. There was no Aaron Gordon, so he started at the four, which is his best position. I think actually the three is probably Isaac's worst position out of the three he can play. I think he's a four, he's a five, and then he's a three. Um, yeah, so strong numbers here, but when Gordo comes back, I don't know what they do with him. They should play him over John Simmons because he's bad. 13 points in 23 minutes for Simo. That's okay with the scoring. He just doesn't do enough. He just I don't, I don't like him as a basketball player, and he's not a good fantasy guy. Well, Terry Ross couldn't keep up that level of efficiency. 10 points on 16 shots. The three steals are nice. The block is nice. He has back-end value, but his upside's nowhere near that of, say, someone like John Isaac. Mo Bamba. One, two, three, four, five. You probably prioritize him below Mitchell Robinson as a blocks streamer, but that's all he is. And also continue to say, as long as the Magic are in playoff contention, Vooch won't get traded if they continue, if they just fall off completely. And they've had two tough losses here, which they could have won both of them against the Blazers and the Warriors. So they're not like, oh, the wheels are falling off style. Um, they could have won both of these games on this road trip. They've beaten the Lakers already and narrowly lost to the Warriors and the Blazers. So it's not a case of that. But if they continue to be in playoff contention, Vucevic isn't getting traded, I don't think, anyway. With no Gordon, Jarrell Martin uh, got some minutes there. Also, for the uh, Blazers, Dame Lillard broke, broke the Trailblazers franchise record with 10 triples, 41 points, 8 rebounds, 4 assists. He just pulls the pants out of the Magic every year. 16, 13, and uh, 5 for Yusuf Nurkic as well, while Sauce Castillo got hot. 18 points for Stauskas in 19 minutes with 5 triples. We saw that a little bit for him at the start of the season, and then it uh, has fallen away. Zachy Collins played alongside Nurk in this one. 21 minutes, 7 and 7. But realistically, we're looking for a Nurkic injury for him to really come back to being 12-team league viable. While the chief, El Farouk Aminu. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And to be honest, it was this shit or was this good? Only four points and two rebounds, but the two steals almost resurrected it. Nah, I think we'll call it shit. He is not a 10-team league guy and probably not a 12-team league guy. While Mo Harkless is a 80-team league guy. Two points in 13 minutes. He just looks completely lost with that knee. And I think it's going to be quite a while before he really gets back into any sort of contention for fantasy value. The last game of the night, the Phoenix Suns and the LA Clippers. The Suns waved Isaiah Kane. Apparently, he was good enough to start. And this is something now I'm going to go on a, on a mini rant here. So Suns fans, turn off or whatever. I, I do not understand at all how you can have such a disconnect between the front office and the coaching staff. Because clearly, in my opinion, the coaching, the front office cut Isaiah Kanan because Igor Kokoshkov wouldn't stop playing him. There is a, there's, 
and you can make your coaches mode. They got to win to save their job. This is that's bullshit. It is absolute bullshit because does shouldn't the front office be coming down and go, look, mate, Kanan's not good. He's got nothing to do with our future here. Let's see what we've got in McCall Bridges. Let's see what we've got in Ali Kobo. I'd like you to develop those guys, use them how you see fit, but just you know, just stop playing Kanan. And if he goes, oh, but you know, I need to win. And they go, don't worry about the wins. We're not, we're not firing you if you don't win. We want to see development. We've got a three-year plan in place here. Let's develop it. Do these blokes never talk to each other? Where the front office goes, I want you to stop playing Kane and play a Koba. And Kokoshkov goes, no, I'm playing him. No, no, you have to stop playing him. No, I'm playing him. Well, you can't now because I've taken him and he's gone. What, what, what is this bullshit? It is absolute nonsense. So now that he can't, and we've seen this happen plenty of times, Denver front office did it to Michael Malone with Jameer Nelson because he was playing him over Jamal Murray, so they just cut him. Well, now you can't have him. It is as crazy, it is unbelievably crazy. Anyway, the guy we have to talk about is the guy who I did say at draft time will be starting for the Suns at some point this season. I'm pretty high on him for Dynasty. Ali Okobo, 32 minutes, 19 points, two rebounds, four assists, and three steals. Devin Booker is a point guard. He doesn't want to be a point guard, and Kokoshkov doesn't want him to be a point guard. So I could actually see them making a change here and starting a Koba, but it doesn't matter if he starts or not if he plays 30 minutes a night. I would be looking to add him in 12-team formats. I'd also be looking at him as being inconsistent and this not being something that's going to continue. We have to remember this was fueled by very, very hot shooting, three of five from three. He was five of six from the field in the first half, and that got him those extra minutes in the second half. So who knows if that's going to be a consistent rotation thing, but he is a guy with really Really nice fantasy upside. Talked about him a lot in the offseason regarding that. And now the opportunity is here. So if you're deciding between a Kobo or someone like uh, Ryan Archer Jackano or Quinn Cook, you take the bloke who's got the potential to push up and up and up and solidify, like Shea, Shea Gildas Alexander, who's not going away from that position. I don't know if this is going to stick for a Kobo. I don't know at some point. I think that they will move on from Ariza and they will start a Kobo, Booker, and Bridges as the one, two, and three. I think they'll do that. But this was very, very strong from Ali, and I think you should go and have a look at adding him. Rashawn Holmes also put up big numbers, 10 and 4 with four steals and two blocks. That's fantastic. Do you want a center who plays 17 minutes? That's pretty tough because this was a shithouse DeAndre Ayton game. So Holmesy got more minutes. They don't play together. They can't play together really. Um so that limits what Holmes can do. He's a streamer type of guy. Well, Josh Jackson picked up a shit ton of fouls. Shout out to Marquise Chris. Had 15 and 7 in 20 minutes with two steals. He has really refocused himself. He was one of the, if not the worst player in the NBA through about the first three weeks of this season, but has refocused. And he's not saying we're adding him anywhere, but he's looking a lot better. Aiton was bad, but at least he salvaged it with defensive numbers. Four and nine with two steals and three blocks, while Booker had 23 and Tony Warren Jr. had 15 points with another three triples. Please don't roster Trevor Ariza in 10-team leagues or 12-team leagues. He played 39 minutes and had 8, 7, and 4. He is not a 12-team league guy. And at some point this season, he will not be playing 30 minutes a night. I feel like that is a fait de compli. As for McCall Bridges, he lost that playing time to a Kobo. And as I said, I think at some point we're going to have a Kobo and Bridges both playing 30-plus minutes. But with uh, with a Kobo, uh, with Bridges just not seeing any touches offensively, the defense not there and the minutes dropping. If you want to drop Bridges for a Kobo, I'm totally on board with that. I still think Ali can be, not Ali, uh, McCall can still be a top 100, top 110 player this season if he gets a 16% usage and plays 30 minutes a night. But you have to go the recent trend. It's probably not That's not going to happen. But I could easily see him playing 25 next game and a Kobo playing 24 and those guys almost splitting those minutes. It is sell high time on the rooster Danilo Gallinari. But when I say sell high, you have to make sure it's the right deal. 28 and 10 with four triples, four assists, and two blocks. That is a fantastic line for the rooster. You picked him with the last pick in your draft. Someone holds pretty high on drafting in all those situations. And he is a top 45 player this season and a top 30 player over the last two weeks. But this is a bloke who cannot stay healthy. But of course, someone is injury prone until they aren't. So there is a chance, a slim one, there's a chance that he plays 70 games this season. So when you're trading him away, you don't trade him away for a bloke who's the 80th best player because you go, oh, at least I can get some value out of it. You don't do that. If you trade him away, you want to get a top 50 guy back. Now, that might be impossible, but people might be into the, and, and they might be right. There is no 100% guarantee here that he gets hurt. He's probably as close to 100% as anybody in the NBA that he gets hurt maybe Chris Paul, but it's not 100% that he's going to get hurt. 
And if he doesn't get hurt, there's no reason that he doesn't finish this season as a top 40 player. There's a legitimate chance of him doing that. He has been amazing this season, really turning it around from last year. He probably will get hurt. You explore it. But the likelihood of you losing a trade increases if you trade him for someone who's a top 100 player. Because that 30% chance that he stays healthy the entire season is not worth it for such minimal return. Now, if he's going to be a top 30 player for the rest of the season and you get back a top 50 guy, I think that's balancing your risk pretty nicely. But if you're going to go real low and if something, if you say, I've got to get rid of him, I've got to trade him, he's going to get hurt, he's going to get hurt, and you end up trading him for Gilgis Alexander, as an example, maybe using someone on his own team, I'm not sure that's a win as a trade. If you're going to trade him for Reggie Jackson, it's not a win. Because there's still a legitimate chance that Gallinari plays more minutes and has a significantly better return. So, always be careful. Lou Williams, 20 points in 22 minutes. While as for Shea, who I mentioned, big night. 13, 7, and 6, a steal and a block. I think he's a must-roster player. I've been saying that for a while. While Marching Gortat was out with a back injury, so Boban started. 12 and 12 in 19 minutes for Boban. 3 of 6 from the field, 6 of 6 from the line. Strong performance from Marjanovic. I think we all know not to take the bait and add him outside of deeper leagues. The table, 18 and 6 with two blocks. Big numbers again. The free throws are, are really becoming a problem now for Harrell, and that's something we have to pay attention to. Well, Avery Bradley, he has gone from a guy that everybody wanted to Dutch rudder. Oh, man, so good. Man, Avery Bradley, best best defender. How is he not all NBA? To being a guy that you have to go, is he actually an NBA player anymore? Not, not an all NBA defensive guy. Like, is he actually an NBA player? Because he is terrible. Zero of seven for zero points in 29 minutes, and he should not be touching 10, 12, 14, 16 team league fantasy. He just is shitful. And it's uh it's pretty weird to see the uh, the transition in the uh, in the old Avery Bradley. All right, let's move in now and talk some uh, talk some DFS. Um, we we'll start with the perfect lineup over on DraftKings. Timmy Frazier with Jim Harden, Damo Dotson, Mario Hazonia, Rudy Gobert, Russell Westbrook, the Rooster, and Archer Jackano for a total of four twenty. Point five with a total of forty nine thousand five hundred dollars, and then we uh, then we go on to the perfect lineup over on the old Fangel Westbrook and Archer Jackano, Jim Harden and Damo Dotson, the Rooster and Ubre, Jeremy Grant, Joshy Jackson and Rudy Gobert for a total of four forty five point six, and that costs fifty nine thousand eight hundred dollar dues. There are three games on. We're going to be looking at Fangel pricing mainly for Thursday. The first one is the Golden State Warriors and the Toronto Raptors. No status um, for this game. Not no status. No uh, spread, no total, because at the time uh, of when this was put out, the Steph Curry status was unknown. It has since been updated that he is out, Draymond Green is out, and Alfonso McKinney are out. So you imagine the Raptors would open up favorite here at home with those three blokes out at point guard, we're looking at Kyle Lowry at 8,000. A very good record against the Warriors, averaging 45 the last three times against them. I think he's a real strong option on Fangel at $8,000. You've got Quinny Cook at 54, who's been giving you 26 to 27, which is okay at 54. And given the tightness of Fangel pricing, I don't mind that. Well, Van Vliet had a monster last game at 33. Uh, 33 points in his uh, 22 minutes, but that's because he didn't miss a shot. So I'm not really buying into that one. For the shooting guards, Iguodala, I want nothing to do with, but Clay Thompson at 7,000, I am bang on on that. That is an absolute cash lock, averaging 41 over the last three, taking a shit ton of shots. All about Clay Thompson, Dan Green, uh, not so much. For the small forwards, you've got the fun guy. I'm a fun guy. <laughs> uh, Kawhi Leonard, 10,200, a 50 average against the Warriors. I think he's absolutely fine to consider here as well on a three-game slate where the value is not necessarily that huge. While uh, Kevin Durant at 11.5, he is averaging 70 the last three games. Back-to-back 44 real-life point performances from Kevin Durant. Of course, Kawhi Leonard guarding him is a, is a factor and it is a negative, but I still think at 11.5, he is worth it. I think Leonard at 10.2 is obviously a pretty strong play as well. Barker's at 6,000, has struggled against the Warriors, but it's a little bit of a different ball game this season. I'm not super into him. Uh, maybe for tournaments. I don't really feel it. Well, Siakam at 6,800. That's, I think that's too expensive for Pascal, who's averaging just 31 over the last five, and at 68. That's that's not quite getting it done. Yunus Sharepko at 3,800. He might start for Draymond Green. He may not. He's going to get minutes. He's just a, a real flyer at this point. 
And at center, you've got Yunus. Yunus? This one's Jonas. Jonas Valanciunas at 5,600, hated against the Warriors. Kavon Looney at 39, Jordy Bell at 35, and Damo Jones at 39. And I want uh, Sweet FA to do with those guys. On DraftKings, we're looking at value here with a Barker as a 5,500 GPP guy. I like Lowry at 8,000. I like the fun guy at 9,300. Siakam at 61 is in a better spot on DraftKings. Still not as good as what he has been in the past. And Clay Thompson, worse on DraftKings. 7,400 is probably a bit expensive. I still like it, but it's not as value as it is on Fangio. And 11,000 for uh, for old Mr. Burner KD. Let's go on to the, uh, onto the next game now. We're looking at the LA Clippers on the back-to-back against the Sacramento Kings. The Clippers are favored by three, and the total is 235 points. I don't imagine that Luke Marmute is going to play in this one. I think the Kings are going to make a lineup change. Dave Yeager has been alluding to it. Oh, I've had a few days off. Give us a chance to look at some lineup combinations, just see what's been working. I think there's going to be a change. I think Marvin Bagley is going to start for Nemanja Bielica. The other thing that could happen is that Bogdan Bogdanovich could start for Iman Shumpert. They're the two things that I think are going to happen. I don't think it's going to be anything involving Harry Giles. I think we're going to have Fox healed. Bogdanovich, Bagley, and Corley Stein as the starters. That is my guess. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, that's just reading the tea leaf to see what's going to happen. Um, for for the uh, for the Clippers, Gortat, if he is out, then we get Boban in that starting role as well, who could be worth a, a GPP sort of a guy. De'Aaron Foxy Fox on Fangel at 7,600. I really like that for Fox, although... Uh, point guards have had a tough go of things against the Clippers this season. I think that Foxy is is worth a go at that price. Gilgis Alexander's at 52. Obviously played well today with 32 points. Not a bad option. There are some better ones out there, but he, he's still looking okay with a relatively solid floor. Lower score over his last five games for Shea is 20 points. So that's pretty good floor for a rookie. Beverly at 3,800 is, yeah, no, he's just not playing enough. Shooting guard, Bogdan's at 5,700. I like that. Big minutes last game. Doesn't matter if he starts or not. He'll play 30, I imagine. So I do like him here. While Budrick healed at 6,000. Not quite living up to that number. I would take Bogdan over Budrick pretty comfortably. Shumpert's at 4,500. I uh, don't think there's much value there. While Lou Williams at 62. It's a big price for Lou, and he's done very well against the Kings, but the minutes aren't the same as what he was getting last season, where he averaged uh, 38 points in 32 minutes in the three games, or the last three games he played against him. So I'm not really sure that he is more than a, a tournament guy. The small forwards, the Rooster is at 7,000, averaging 42 points the last three games. Danilo Gallinari. Uh, really like him. And Bielitsa at 44. That's a strong, strong fade. At power forward, the table, Montrez Harrell like it. The minutes are there. Al Bagley at 6,700. That's a pretty big price jump for Bags. But he is averaging 34 over the last five. And if you, like me, believe that he is going to start, then I think you should be looking at him, especially for tournaments. Uh, Toby Harris at 84 is a strong, strong cash play. Well, Gilesy had 45 points at 4,100. Definitely not not a bad idea to have in, him into a tournament. Not sure he's able to put up that level of production because that was pretty bloody crazy. Cauley Stein at 68. I hate it for cash, but I think there is 40-point upside for tournaments. So I, I'd consider it there. While Gortat is, is a no, and Boban at 47 would be a, a cash play with his 26 points that he had today, assuming that uh, Marchin is out. On DraftKings, I like Bagley. I like Shump at 36, actually a bit over there. Uh, Bogdan, Fox, Harrell, and Harris. I think they've all got cash value. Corley Stein and, and Louis Williams, more your tournament uh, tournament players. The last game of the day is the Indiana Pacers and the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers are favored by four and a half, and the total is 217 points. The only uh, injury question mark here, Victor Oladipo's out, uh, is Lonzo Ball, who is questionable. Um uh, point guard wise, Lonzo at 6,700 would be tournament wise worthy if he plays. Uh, otherwise, you've got Corey Joseph and Daz Collison. Collison at 6,300. He's given you around 30 the last few that Oladipo's been out. I, I just don't feel super confident. I don't think there's much upside in, in Collison either at that sort of a price. Uh, shooting guards, Contavious Corwell Pope. Uh, Josh Hart at 36, I'd be really into if Lonzo is out. I think he's a good tournament player. While Aaron Holiday at 4,100, probably not going to use him at, at that sort of an elevated uh, price tag. Small forward, Ingram's at 63. I really like Ingram if Lonzo is out. I think they'll play him at point guard quite a bit, which should push him to 35 to 37 points. Um, but at this point, if if Lonzo's, if Lonzo's in, I'm not sure we're looking at him. While Tyreek's at 51, just doing jack shit really this season. Really disappointing. LeBron James. LeBron averages uh, almost 60 Fangio points against the Pacers. Yes, as a member of the Cavs, but 11-4, I, I like him. I like him more than Durant, to be honest. 
in this one. Um, doesn't have Kawhi having to guard him. While Stevenson at 3,700, I actually like Lance here against his former team if Lonzo Ball is out. I think that would become a very, very strong cash play. The Deuce Young's at 5,200, a weirdly good record against the Lakers as well. 33-point average the last three times. He's been a little bit underwhelming, but that price is, is good enough for me to consider him. While the future MVP, Kyle Kuzma, two strong games in a row for Kuz. Uh, can you get another 30? Yeah, maybe, but I'm not feeling super confident in, in using him. At center, it's JaVale McGee and Tyson Chandler on the Lakers side, but the guys we really want to look at are Miles Turner and DeMontis Sabonis. Turner is up to 7,200 now because he is just blocking everything. I think that might be marginally too high for Miles. Um, and as for DeMontis, who is he? He's actually listed as a... No, he's a power forward or is he a center? Yeah, he's a power forward, actually. He's at 7,500. He's averaging 41 over the last three games. Oh, I feel much better about using Sabonis than I do about using Miles Turner. Well, Doug McDirt on the back of two 20-point games, uh, you, please don't chase that. That uh, will likely not end well. On DraftKings, I like Ingram, Kuzma, LeBron, and Daz Collison, who is at 4700 a very good price for Dazza. While Thaddeus Young's at 45 I also like that quite a bit. Over on the old DK. Let's go in now and just go through some studs and values on DraftKings. You've got Lowry as my stud at $8,000 against the Warriors, and my value is Marvin Bagley at $5,300. On Fangio, we're going Lowry again at $8,000 as the stud, and the value play, we're looking at old Bogdan Bogdanovich at $5,700. On Yahoo, my stud is the fun guy Kawhi Leonard at $41, and my value is Bogdan at $13. And then on Draft Stars, my stud is LeBron at 18,780. And uh, my value is Bogdan at 9,190. That will do it for a Thursday edition of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Check out our sponsor, actionheat.com slash locked on for 20% off your Action Heat orders. Follow me on Twitter at redrock underscore b-ball. And also follow the network at Locked On NBA Net on both Twitter and on Instagram. Subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Thumbs up, subscribe, notification bell. You know all the way to, to do it. Check out those fantasy check-in videos that I'm doing as well. Two to three minute videos, just giving a state of each team. I'm going to do three a day and cover each team once every two weeks. I hope you guys are enjoying those as well over on the YouTube channel. Guys, we are are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Rick Carlisle.